Order, please. We'll call the meeting of the Special Committee to review the estimates of the Auditor General and the Chief Electoral Officer to order. I'm going to ask the committee members to introduce themselves. I'll introduce myself first. I'm Keith Bain, Speaker of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly. Ms. Simmons. Angela Simmons, uh, Deputy Speaker and MLA for Preston. Ms. Maslund. Good afternoon. Kim Maslund, MLA for Queens. Mr. McMaster. Alan McMaster, MLA for Inverness. Ms. Barkos. Danielle Barkos, MLA for Chester St. Margaret's. Mr. Mumberkett. Uh, good afternoon, Derek Mumberkett, MLA City Member 2. Mr. Irving. Keith Irving, MLA King South. And Ms. LeBlanc. Hi, Susan LeBlanc, MLA for Dartmouth North. Thank you. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of other people that are here. I think the uh, Ms. Regan thought of she were going to forget about her. But <laughs> I want to introduce the Honorable Kelly Regan, Chair of the Standing Committee on Public Accounts. She's entitled to attend under Section 16 of the Auditor General Act and Section 19 of the Elections Act. I also want to recognize James Charlton, Chief Clerk, uh, Gordon Hebb, Chief Legislative Counsel, and Matthew Timmons, our Director of Administration. So the, the agenda and the materials were circulated in advance of the meeting, and the representatives of both Elections Nova Scotia and the Office of Auditor General have each requested an opportunity to make brief opening remarks to the special committee before the special committee considers their estimates. Is this, uh, does the committee agree with all this? Agreed? Okay. So first off, we'll invite representatives of Elections Nova Scotia to come forward to take a seat and introduce themselves and make their opening remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity to present our budget request. As an independent, nonpartisan agency, Elections Nova Scotia reports to the members of the House of Assembly through the Speaker. Our mission to deliver provincial elections impartially and professionally is drawn from the Elections Act. Our vision to be trusted by all Nova Scotians to excel in the delivery of fair and inclusive elections is founded on our independence from the executive branch of Nova Scotia's government. We are one of the four independent offices of this House who are charged with upholding government accountability. Independence for election management bodies is a widely accepted international norm and is the single most important attribute of a credible electoral authority. ENS has undergone several changes in the last year and I would like to thank my predecessor, predecessor Richard Temporale, for his leadership through three general elections during his 10-year appointment in the role of Chief Electoral Officer. I would also like to acknowledge that the budget pre preparation and program planning has been made easier since the introduction of fixed election date legislation in 2021. The four-year cycle that we plan for enables better scheduling for hiring of staff, training, equipment and materials procurement, and the rental of voting locations. The next general election is scheduled for July of 2025, and the intense period of preparation and spending will take place in 2024-25 fiscal year. In the last year, ENS has recommended legislative changes following the introduction of fixed, fixed date elections and the 2021 provincial general election. These proposed changes impact electoral finance and operations. The ideal timeline for introduction of these changes is in the fall of 2023 sitting of the legislature in order to incorporate all modifications in the training materials for returning office staff and the official agents of parties and candidates. Just as independence and oversight go hand in hand, our presentation here today to this special committee provides a necessary measure of transparency and accountability to the members of the Assembly. The report you have before you today includes $728,000 of additional funding needed to fulfill our mandate compared to the budget targets received to date. Well, that was at the November or the December uh, date. This includes ongoing funding requirements for projects presented and approved by this committee in last year's budget for the e-voting mandate legislated in the Elections Act. Additional funding is also included for a full-time outreach coordinator to support ENS's inclusion, diversity, equity and accessibility programming. 
It also includes funding for one by-election, outside legal counsel, plus the incremental funding required by law for registered party annual payments. For transparency purposes, we have segregated the amounts included for each of these initiatives to ensure you are fully informed of precisely what we intend to spend these funds on. If Finance, Treasury and Policy Board significantly alters the amounts you recommend to them today, I commit to send a report to each member of this committee summarizing the changes made. I respectfully request that you accept our budget as presented and recommend it without alteration to Finance, Treasury and Policy Board. And I thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Ms. Rice. And, and first of all, congratulations to you and your appointment as the Chief Electoral Officer as well. So, is there any questions from any of the members? Mr. Irving. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your presentation. I have a couple questions, if I am permitted. Uh, first of all, uh, I noticed uh, last year uh, you request $50,000 in legal costs. Uh, you were granted nothing. Uh, what was the outcome of that? And I see that you have, again, requested, uh, I think it's 52000 uh, for legal counsel. Ms. Rice. Ms. Rice. I will answer. Okay, as soon as, it, as soon as the little red light came on. Uh, yeah, so that $50,000 is something we have been requesting on an ongoing basis because of the conflict of interest that we anticipate may happen sometime if we have to investigate a, a party-related uh, incident that takes place. We haven't had to do too many of those, but and certainly none in the last year, but, uh, but we do want to make sure that we have the provision for that should that occur. Mr. Irving. Thank you very much. Uh, and my second question is, could you uh, uh, give us some more detail uh, on, the, uh, on the additional funds for outreach strategy that you're uh, identified as a new emerging priority? Is that a priority of government or a priority of yours, and what would that entail? Ms. Harris. Thank you. Uh, so that is a priority of our office. We have just published a, a new strategic plan in the summer of this year, and one of the um, main tenets of that is to increase our outreach to groups that we uh, believe may need a little bit of extra um, urging to become part of the electoral process. Yeah. But it also matches very nicely with the government's initiatives for, for uh, diversity and for uh, accessibility. Mr. Irving. One quick supplementary, thank you. Um, and has this idea been uh, run by government, or is this the first time that my colleagues at the table here are hearing about it? Have you got any indication from government of uh, support of this? We haven't officially, uh, sorry, we haven't officially um, presented this to any government uh, officials. We have certainly included it here, and we've included it in our public, uh, publicly made um, strategic plan. Mr. Mabriquet. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, just, just one of your comments, and thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Um, is in regards, you said f funding for one by-election. So, in the event you have multiple, how does that, how does that affect your, how does that impact your budget? Ms. Rice. So, should we have more than one by-election in this fiscal year, we would have to go back to Finance and Treasury Board and request additional funds for that. Each by-election costs around a quarter million dollars. So, at this point, we've uh, submitted for one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion or questions, Ms. Regan? Uh, just one. Uh, I noted under service delivery and development, there is uh, an increase of. Um, A fair bit to 590 from from um, forecast of, of 300 for 22 23. Um, was that was that the outreach there? Was that part of that? Ms. Rice, <laughs> I keep forgetting. Uh, part of that is for outreach, but the bulk of it is for the e-voting system that we are in the process of, uh, of awarding a contract in the next few weeks for. Ms. Regan. Rookie mistake, right? <laughs> um, um, so, for when you say e-voting, what would that be used for? 
Ms. Wright. Uh, oh, obviously sorry. for voting, but but also, you know, in what particular circumstances would, would a person be allowed to do an electronic vo vote? Ms. Wright. So under our current legislation, we are um, authorized to provide e-voting. At this point, it is to a small group of military personnel who are stationed outside of Nova Scotia. So that is our first step in the, into this new uh, initiative. Okay. Mr. Bumber, can you have another question? Yeah, just uh, quickly, just uh, following up on, on MLA Regan's, um, you may have just answered, it was around the e-voting, just, you know, how do you envision the next year and getting into the, maybe this is a conversation for a larger discussion, but I'm just curious on the e-voting just based on the capacity to do it and there's probably better capacity in urban areas as uh, compared to the r uh, rural areas when it comes to e-voting. So are you guys looking at that too as well? Like are you expanding it beyond? Are you saying it's military now, but is the plan to try to expand as far as you can? Ms. Price. So at this point, it is certainly just for the military who are stationed outside of Nova Scotia. And this is a step in that, in that uh, journey, and we'll see where it goes from there. We're trying to build some confidence and some security here. We will be the first province in Canada to introduce electronic voting. Any further discussion or questions? Hearing none, I'd ask for someone to move that the special committee approve the estimates of the chief electoral officer for 2023-2024 fiscal year and that the chair recommend the estimates to the Treasury Board for inclusion in the government's estimates. Do we have a mover? Moved by Ms. LeBlanc. Do we have a seconder? Second. Mr. Irving. For all those in favor of the motion, please show your consent by saying aye. Aye. Count reminded nay. The motion is carried. Thank you. So now we'll call on the Office of the Auditor General to come forward and uh, introduce themselves and we'll ask for their presentation. Ms. Adair. Good afternoon, Kim Adair, Auditor General. Good afternoon, Mike McPhee, Deputy Auditor General. Please uh, make your presentation. Okay. Um, so we're pleased to be here this afternoon to meet with the committee to take you through our budget request for the next fiscal year. Um, and I will just speak to some of the highlights and then certainly open it up to questions. Um, essentially, we're asking for incremental funding of $1.1 million. Uh, we're currently at $5.2 million. So and the number, there's a number in the chart that would bring us to $6.3 million. What is behind that ask? Essentially, it's to fund uh, the health audit function. This is a new uh, area of responsibility for our office. Um, and how it came about, uh, just to give you a bit of background information, um, there was mention of this briefly in our budget documentation last year. Um, it is in the mandate letter of the Minister of Health to create a health audit function. Um, we were having preliminary conversations with government at that point in time about the notion of our office carrying out that role in addition to what we do now under the Auditor General Act. Um, at the sort of late stages of the budget process last year, we were given some preliminary funding, essentially funding for two positions, $277,000. And uh, it was intended to get us started to think through what this health audit function would look like. Um, it is a, a, a new, um, I guess, mandate. No other Auditor General in Canada has what they call the health audit function responsibility. So it's a new concept. Uh, we needed to, to to develop just what that would look like. Um, so we're now a year later. We've had some conversations with the health leadership team to essentially map out what we would deliver on. Um, and I can tell you that it's sort of a three-pronged uh, model that we would deliver on. We would do performance audits of the health uh, area. So roughly 
the of the total $14 billion annual spend of the government, health is $6 billion. So to put it in context, we're asking for $1.1 million to have an audit function devoted to health of, of one point. When you add the, the amount we got last year plus this year, it's $1.4 million on a $6 billion spend. Um, so there's the performance audits that we would do or value for money audits. Um, then there's the um, weighing in on KPIs, key performance indicators. Um, the government has a dashboard that is up for the public to see. So we would uh, be an independent office that looks at the information behind that dashboard and report on whether or not the public can rely on the information that is on that dashboard. Um, so that's the second part. And then the third part is to weigh in on how Nova Scotia is delivering on health care performance indicators compared to other provinces in Canada. Um, so that's the preliminary discussions that we've had with the health leadership team. So we took that back and looked at it and said, okay, so what kind of resourcing do we need to deliver on those three pieces? And um, what was important to me is that this additional new function wasn't able to erode the work of the office that we already do. Um, so uh, what we're asking for today, it's essentially, so it's, it's 1.1 million uh, and very rough numbers and the chart is in the report and I can speak to the, to, to the details, but it's around half a million dollars to fund five positions. Um, so that's four more auditors to add to the two that we have just recently hired. And then the, so that's four, and then there's one more position for what we're calling a, a finance, budget, and procurement officer. Um, we're an independent office, so we, we don't have uh, like the government finance function or procurement people that we rely on or can use. So um, up to this point in time, that function, we have been using a portion of an auditor to carry it out. But we're at the point in time where we're growing, and this would put us in the range of 40 people. So we want to, uh, we're, what we're asking here is to have a, a devoted person to do that. Um, so that's the first 500,000. And then the, the rest is uh, operations. And the biggest chunk of that is to hire health experts. Um, so it's roughly 300,000 because we know that that uh, we have a lot of skill set within the office. Uh, some of you are members of the Public Accounts Committee and, and you know sort of what we have in terms of the professional team, but we are not health experts. So we've added some consulting funding into the ask so that when we're looking at say the ambulance system, for example, which is something we're looking at if we want to hire uh, health experts in that field or uh, primary care or ER operations, I mean, the, there's so many areas that we'll be getting into that we anticipate needing that consulting um, or expertise uh, funding that would not be a permanent position in our office, but it would be specific to uh, whatever audit we're doing at any point in time. Um, and then in addition to that, there's some funding to move some walls in the office to be able to fit the additional people in. We're, we're not proposing to increase our footprint, but we're just going to sort of make people uh, have some space within our existing uh, square footage. Um, so I think that gives you the highlights of our ask. Um, maybe now I'll open it up to questions. Thank you, Ms. Adair. Uh, questions uh, from any of the members? Mr. Irving. <coughs> Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, and uh, I have to say I, I fully support this, this initiative, and I'm very happy to hear that government is behind this and will be supporting it, obviously, since it's in a mandate letter. Um, uh, probably a couple questions or comments here, but uh, maybe I'll just begin with the, the health performance indicators. Um, is there any concerns or risks of kind of duplication of uh, data that is already out there. In other words, I believe it's called CAIHI, the Canadian Institute of Health Indicators or something, that has a lot of data 
across the country that does that work of comparing to other provinces. Is that, uh, are, have you looked into that and envisioning, I guess, an enhancement of that data? And, and, or is there any kind of risks of overlap? Or are you not quite into that level of detail? Mr. Dare. Ms. Adair? Okay. There, there, your mic was out. Okay. The, the, you mentioned the Kai Hai data, and that's essentially the, the database that we would use when we're looking at the provincial comparison to other provinces. Um, we're not sure yet how reliable that data is. We're hoping that it's an apples to apples comparison, province to province. Um, but they're, yeah, they capture data both on a clinical basis and a financial basis for each province in Canada. So that's what we plan to use. Um, in terms of duplication, we're, we don't want to duplicate the effort. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we will have uh, periodic meetings from time to time with the health leadership team. Uh, there is an internal audit function uh, in like the health authority or the departments. Um, so we will be consulting with them to make sure that we're not duplicating effort. Um, and there, there is a consultative approach here that I want to maintain. Uh, it's, it's important that we maintain our independence, but yet we're not going to do it in isolation without talking to the, the senior leadership in government to make sure it all makes sense and that we add value and that we're producing reports that will be, everything will be public. As you know, work of our office is public um, and we're independent. So that's why I think it's a good fit for this function. Um, so, yeah. On the same topic? Or? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Ms. LeBlanc, then we'll go back to Mr. Irving. Thanks. Well, I have a question and a comment. My question, or my comment is I uh, fully support this as a member of the Public Accounts Committee. I think it's really important, um, and I'm excited uh, to see this new, these new audits come down the, the pike. Um, but my question is, do we need to see a change in legislation to add this as the ma part of the mandate of the office? Mr. Dare. Okay. Uh, at, I, that's a good question, and it, perhaps at some point, once we evolve it and, and develop it to know what it looks like, it might be time to look at legislation. I think that within the existing act, we do have the mandate to audit the total public purse and the total spending, which includes the six billion in, in healthcare. Um, but there might be reason, I don't, know, to make it a permanent. Uh, arrangement for the office that at some point put it in legislation. Yeah. Mr. Lamont, you okay with that? Okay. Mr. Irving and then Ms. Regan. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, my next question is is on the health infrastructure. Where will that fit into this? Uh, uh, the, uh, you know, that is outside of obviously that uh, that Six billion, uh, six billion in operational costs, but we are talking billions in capital costs. We've got a project right now with one bidder, with the situation completely changing from the Auditor General's uh, views and advice on the P3 model. We now have high inflation uh, uh, and and much higher borrowing costs. Will you be looking at that? through this lens or through your main lens as the Auditor General? Ms. Adair. Um, I, I see the capital piece part and parcel of the health audit function. Um, but as you point out, like we already have done performance audits on the capital spending in the health care area. So where the line is drawn, I, I don't know that um, it will matter. But I think the, the important thing is that we intend to report and do audits in that area the same as the rest of the, the operational spending. Yeah. Ms. Regan? Um, just, some, just some questions about the numbers that are, are in the proposed <coughs> budget. Uh, the Auditor General knows I'm a fan of uh, the work of her office, but just uh, wanting to understand what some of the numbers are. Um, so in terms of membership dues from 75 to 90,000, is that for um, because the dues are increasing, or is it because uh, we'll have more people on staff, or both? Mr. Dare. Yeah, it, it's a little bit of both. Yeah, yeah. And in terms 
Ms. Ms. Regan. Just try to in terms of operating supplies, um, we go from 85,000 to 145,000. So I was just wondering what the increase, what, what accounts for the increase there? Ms. Adair. Um, what is in there is 20,000 for IT equipment for five new positions and 40,000 for audiovisual equipment so that we can have uh, be better equipped for virtual meetings and the setup in our boardroom and certain offices. So. Ms. Ms. My last one is um, actually last two. So the professional services that we see uh, um, more than double, but that is uh, just confirming that that is in fact uh, the experts that you are bringing in uh, around the health file. And um, in terms of tr in province travel, it almost doubles. Is that uh, again because of the uh, added scope that we're talking about from 17 to 30 thousand uh, dollars? Is that because of the added scope? Ms. Adair. Yes, it's for that as well as the fact that we're now back into the, the pre-COVID environment where we tend to go work on site more and, and travel around the province. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Any further questions or discussion, Mr. Irving? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I just want to uh, conclude uh, and, and make a, a few comments of how important I believe this is. Uh, and I want to, uh, you know, to to know that you have the full support of the opposition on this. And I'm hoping with the government, because uh, I know that we'll leave this table and it will go to the cabinet table where that decision <coughs> decision will be made. But I, I, you know, I think you've underscored the importance in the in the value of, of this envelope uh, and the need for additional oversight. I mean, we've got a situation right now where a government is in crisis and they were being very reactive and making very decisions very, very quickly. And I would submit uh, uh, that, uh, you know, these are the, the times in which uh, procurement processes can, can become lax or checks and balances can be skipped over. Uh, so I think it's really important uh, to have you work on this and have the resources to ensure that Nova Scotians uh, taxpayers money is being spent wisely through through this health care crisis um, it, it's you know it's when we have uh, a government messaging to the private sector that we will spend whatever it takes and we will go like hell and we've got one bidder uh, we're going to do this uh, I, I think it's uh, it's just important for Nova Scotians to know that that there's some accountability behind the, the spending decisions um, I think the federal government is asking the provinces to uh, for accountability in their spending as they continue to ask for more federal dollars. We know this year that the government will be uh, receiving 10.4 percent increase in federal transfer. That's significant dollars. The federal government is looking to provinces for accountability. So I uh, believe that this work that you're about to take on and that hopefully we will be funding is actually critical to ensuring that we are getting value for taxpayers' dollars as uh, as we move through this crisis. So thank you. Mr. Dair, I don't know if you want to comment on that or just, no. Ms. Regan. Yes, so just, just one um, question. I, I think during the last election, uh, the government did campaign on having a health care auditor. So will there be one person in this office um, one additional person who is charged with that function, will there be a health care auditor or will it be sort of shared amongst your other work? How is, I'm just wondering how that's, how you see that working. Ms. Adair. I guess, so essentially that would be me <laughs> with the team that we're asking to resource today. So it's essentially um, a, a devoted team within the office focused on this, this health audit function. Um, I liken it to, in some provinces, the Auditor Generals have um, an environment commissioner. 
So it's like a separate division or an arm within the Auditor General's office, but they produce independent reports on environment. So this, in this case, it will be on, on health care. Um, Ms. Regan, on a follow-up? Yes. So, so we can expect a separate report from this team, or it will be coming from you? I'm just, I just want to make sure we understand that. Ms. Adair. From me. Mr. Mubrikat. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just. I'm, I think it's great. I think this is uh, money well spent. Uh, I think it's. Uh, I think the most up-to-date data we can have to provide the Nova Scotians, uh, the better. I'm just curious of, about a few more comments on the dashboard. You say you're, you're looking at the. So that would be the, the need to family practice wait list. That would be some. Would you be looking at some of that stuff too as well? Like what information we're providing to. The community, because we're, you know, that stuff's being updated on a monthly basis. So, so I'm just curious. So, you'd be looking at some of that stuff too, as well, in your in your in your performance audits. Yes. Okay. Yes, excellent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, excellent. Okay. Good. No. Good. Any further discussion or questions? Hearing none, I'd ask that someone move that the special committee approve the estimates of the office of the Auditor General for the 2023-24 fiscal year. And that the chair recommend the estimates to the Treasury Board for inclusion in the government's estimates. Moved by Mr. Mabuket, second by Ms. Simmons. You've heard the motion, you're ready for the question. All those in favor? Recorded vote. We'll take a brief pause to have the recorded vote. Unless you just want to go right through and, and ask everybody. Okay, I'm going to start. Okay. Mr. McMaster. I'll have to abstain because I'm part of the formal, the official government budgeting process, so I don't want to place myself in conflict before those decisions are made, so I'll be abstaining. Ms. Barkhouse. Yes. Uh, Ms. Masland. Yes. Ms. LeBlanc. Yes. Ms. Simmons. Yes. Mr. Irving? Yes. Mr. Momberquette? Yes. And Mr. Bain? Yes. Uh, four, we have nine in favor and zero against. Okay. The motion is carried. So that concludes, oh. I'm sorry, the oh. chief clerk. I apologize, I actually miscounted. Because of our abstention, we had eight in favor and none against. My apologies. You'll for, you're, 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 forgive, yes. you're forgiven at this point. So that, that concludes the special committee meeting. And we're going, I'm going to remind the members of the special committee that a meeting of the House of Assembly Management Commission will be conducted after we take a very, very, very short break. So again, I want to thank the officials from Elections Nova Scotia and the Auditor General's Office for coming here today and making your presentation. Thank you so much. We'll take a brief pause.